Good afternoon for those of you on the East Coast and good morning for those of you on the West Coast. This is Lauren Kelly at OPEX Engine welcoming everyone to our April SaaS Benchmarking Community Webinar on Do Your SaaS Sales Comp Plans Accomplish Your Goals? Just a quick um, housekeeping. Um, all the participants on the phone should have on mute. If you hear an echo, um, try dialing in on a landline and also make sure that the sound on your computer is turned off. You are welcome to uh, type in um, questions in chat. We'd love to hear what questions you have and what you're thinking about the presentation. And then at the end of the presentation, we are also going to turn on a little survey and ask for your feedback. And we're particularly interested in what topics you're interested in hearing um, about in upcoming monthly webinars. So with that, I would like to welcome our two panelists today, two members of the SAS benchmarking community. We have Anthony Nitsos from Duo Security. Um, Anthony brings a wealth of experience not just in um, uh, SAS and software, but also from a variety of other industries to the discussion. And Michael Gonzalez who um, has been VP of Finance at Zenefits out on the West Coast and also previously at Facebook um, and brings an, both a wealth of experience but also a, a West Coast twist if I can put it that way um, of a uh, very cool new business that is well funded and trying to break new ground in a variety of uh, business model areas. And we'll hear from Michael also about um, trying to manage sales expenses and sales compensation. So with that, um, I'd also like to, uh, for those of you on the phone who have been invited but are not yet members of the OPEX Engine SAS benchmarking community, um, I'd love to invite you to find out more. Um, the SAS benchmarking community is something that we run. It's a um, give to get, if you will, uh, benchmarking community just for software and SaaS finance professionals. Um, we have a data platform to benchmark your financial and operating metrics against, as well as biannual meetings, these monthly SaaS community webinars, a searchable knowledge base on SaaS metrics and SaaS Q&A. Um, and it's a paid membership and, and you're welcome to find out more. Um, we, as I mentioned, we have a, um, a benchmarking data platform with over 60 different peer groups for uh, benchmarks. Um, you can look at, compare yourself against companies by size of revenues, average contract value, and also uh, look at um, benchmarks in the future. Um, as you grow your company, as you change your, your model, and we'd love to talk to anybody who's not a member of the, the benchmarking community yet about the value that companies have found um, participating. So with that, I'd love to jump right into the discussion. And um, you know, the, the, SAS, um, the SAS business model is, as we all know, different than selling traditional software where um, in traditional software, a salesperson's job is really somewhat over for the most part as soon as you make the first sale to a customer. You may need to, you may want to expand or upsell, but um, in the SaaS world, selling and bringing in a new customer is just the start of the relationship of the company with the customer. And typically the whole company needs to support the idea that uh, the purpose of a customer or the value of a customer, I should say, is in their recurring revenue. And it has some um, effect on comp plans and um, you know, how you manage that. And when you get into the nitty-gritty details from a finance perspective um, in terms of when, how you pay out, how you measure it, um, and how you manage your sales organization for productivity and for efficiency. 
And so with that, I'd love to ask um, Anthony um, to talk first a little bit about Duo Securities as a company and as a business model, and then talk about your perspective having seen a number of different companies, um, you know, what's different about comp plans in a SaaS company. So uh, Duo Security is an internet security company, and we provide a, a series of hosted services that either protect you know, user credentials using a multi-factor platform, the applications that the users may be using, either you know, their operating systems on their computers or on the phone or particular apps they may be using to make sure that those are up-to-date and secure as well, so they are gated from accessing any systems if they're using buggy software or software with known security deficiencies. And recently, we've added a device management um, part to that, which is a, a, a way of scanning the entire, every, every device that's actually touching your network, even if it doesn't have your own software on it, uh, to find out, again, what, you know, you've got a device in China, and of course, you don't have any workers in China, for example, you might want to ring fence that. So that's kind of what Duo does, and it's done on a subscription basis, paid in advance on an annualized um, contract. That's pretty much what Duo is about. In, our, in the world of SaaS, I come from manufacturing as well. Um, being based in the Midwest, it's hard to escape, you know, having being a finance person and not dealing with manufacturing. Contracts and sales in manufacturing are a lot of them are keyed to gross margin. Uh, they're keyed to long-term contracts. In the SaaS world, it's entirely based in our world in this particular company on the annual value of the contract that's sold. So it's a pretty straightforward model in that regard. Yep. And then Michael, your Zenefits has a slightly different business model. If you could introduce. Zenefits and also talk a little bit about it, your experience, you know, how SaaS comp plans in general are, are different from traditional software. Yep. Uh, so Zenefits is an HR technology company uh, that services small businesses. The original business model thesis for Zenefits was we would give away our software for free in exchange to be the broker of record uh, and provide health insurance benefits to our clients. Uh, so we never the initial business model was not to actually monetize the software, um, but actually just to provide that benefits brokerage service. Uh, along the way, we've introduced more and more HR products that we've, we've started to monetize. So we've shifted uh, away from kind of the free, we still have a free tier, uh, but now we have multiple pricing tiers that allow us to monetize uh, additional applications that we're building, such as payroll, uh, time and attendance, uh, and other premium HR features. Uh, so we're kind of shifting away from, you know, uh, kind of a disruptive business model to a more traditional business model, but we still have that free tier. Uh, we still we still get our booker services. Uh, so we've never really had a traditional software uh, monetization strategy. It's a four-year-old company. Um, so we, uh, with respect to kind of sales compensation, it's, you know, pretty traditional on how we look at uh, the first year first year value, first year ACV, whether it's on us being the broker of record. Uh, and getting commission from insurance carriers, or whether now a near-term shift is to us monetizing our software. Okay. And I think you both mentioned, but I just wanted to clarify, um, are you both only selling one-year contracts, and so you pay your salespeople on one-year contracts, or do you also sell multi-year, and how do you handle that in the comp plan? Is that, oh, is that okay. an interesting Sorry. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead, Anthony. <laughs> that's okay. And maybe Lauren, you could cue us to say which one of us you'd like to answer first, so we don't step on each other and make ourselves look like a interrupting. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> basically in that regard, um, I'm sorry. Could you restate the question? <laughs> so my question was, um, I think you said that you only sell one-year contracts, but I may have misunderstood that. So if you could clarify that, that year. if you yeah, sell, we do sell a year. We do sell. Yeah, we do sell multi-year contracts. Uh, the typical contract, I'd say 98% of our volume on a dollar basis is a single-year contract. That's what most of our customers are comfortable in buying. We do on occasion sell multi-year contracts. They're usually of the flavor, though, where it's a multi-year contract that's billed annually. So in essence, it's just another flavor of an annual contract. Uh, we do, on very rare occasions, get customers who will pay for a multi-year contract up front, but it is by far the corner case. It's not the common case. And just a quick 
follow-up question. So then let's say a salesperson comes in, they say, I've got a contract for three years, we're going to invoice it annually. Um, you know, do you pay them on the first year and not at all on the second or third year? Or do you pay them when the second year payment comes in? Or how do you handle that? There's, uh, they're paid on the annualized contract value. And if it's a multi-year not paid in advance, they get a smaller kicker uh, added to their initial uh, commission. If it's a multi-year paid in advance, they get a larger kicker to their commission. But the basis is still going to be on the annual contract value. Okay. And I guess a, a third, third part of the question is, um, do you pay on the invoicing or do you pay on cash in the door? We pay on the invoicing. Yep. Okay. And Michael, same kind of questions. Do you do multi-year contracts and um, how do you pay your salespeople if you do? Yep. So on the broker side, there is no contract. Uh, you become the broker of record, and as the broker of record, you collect those monthly commissions, but it's not set. Uh, our clients can change their broker of record back to their existing broker to somebody else uh, with kind of just a, a signature. Um, as we move towards more traditional SaaS software sales, uh, we pay on one-year ACV, uh, but we're providing incentives for people who close uh, longer-term contracts based on the invoice. Okay, cool. And it really comes down to, as a company, um, you know, what are your basic goals with your, your sales organization? And um, you know, sometimes that's determined by the stage that you're at. Um, for some companies, cash up front is king, and so they only pay, pay their salespeople on cash. Um, more established businesses you know, will pay on invoicing and, and leave the collection of the cash up to the finance organization. Um, I think it would be good just to hear quickly, you know, your top, when your company is designing a sales comp plan, you know, when you went into 2017, what would you say were the top three goals, um, company goals that you were trying to accomplish through the sales comp plan? And Anthony, why don't we start again with you? Um, our primary goal, goal is growth. We're in a scale-up mode at this point, um, so top-line growth. And not like that's really any different for a startup, but in our particular case, it's a, a huge focus. So all of our comp plans for our sales team is you know, specifically geared towards new business. Our sales team does not get comped on renewal at all. It's not part of the sales team's objective. Their objective is to find new customers and expand existing customers, either in terms of volume or upselling them into new products. Um, additional products. So objective number one is, is growth. <clears throat> oh, underlying that is annualized contracts. Of course, our, our goal is to have annualized paid in advance as opposed to multi-year. I just want to make that distinction that we're looking for really single-year contracts. As an organization, we are not focused on multi-year contracts. That's not a part of our business objective. That's why we don't really incentivize our sales team for multi-year contracts in any manner that really makes that that much advantageous to them. And you know, the third objective, of course, is the one that should you know, be present in every sales plan, is it needs to be rewarding to the players. Um, the salespeople need to feel that what their effort is getting them is worthwhile and commensurate with their skills and their achievements so that they don't take their skills and their product knowledge and their sales knowledge and leave us and go to another company and use it over there. So it helps us keep our sales turnover low. So I'd say the three objectives for us are growth, annual contracts, and keeping our sales turnover low. Great. That's interesting. And Michael, from your perspective? Uh, yeah, so you know, the, the benefit situation, like I said, it's very interesting where we're kind of moving away from that ex our existing model. Um, and we've kind of been in an in-between state right now where we're transitioning our existing customer base to paid tiers. Uh, and going forward, we're going to be going to market with kind of our, with our new strategy. So I think in each of those different stages, our primary objectives have changed a little bit. Um, so uh, just a few examples. I mean, of course, number one is going to be top line. It's going to be top line growth. Um, but as we transition to a model with different ACVs up front uh, and more towards upselling the brokerage side of the business, which um, you know our software seats are going to be anywhere from you know five to fifteen dollars uh, PEPM. Um, you know, on the brokerage side, it's upwards of forty dollars PEPM. 
Um, so sales efficiency would probably be the second one where we have to make sure that our compensation is aligned to uh, the dollars that are going to be coming in the door initially. Uh, and then the third is just making, you know, on, on that same point is when you are transitioning from a, from a, uh, from a go-to-market where your initial offering is $40 per employee per month to something that's, uh, you know, significantly less, uh, you have to incentivize the salespeople to want to sell that stuff. So they got comfortable selling the, the benefit side of the business. Uh, we want to lead with software. We think it's the software first go to market, and then the brokerage is more of an upsell down the road. Um, so you have to we have to incentivize the people to actually want to sell the software when uh, the benefits business is actually closing some some larger deals. Um, but we're actually in the transition stage right now, where we have a kickoff scheduled for for May. Actually, it's right around the corner, where we're going to be introducing kind of our our new uh, you know FY. FY18, our fiscal year ends in January, kind of compensation plan as we get out of this uh, period of transitioning our, our existing customer base to paid. Uh, so on that note, I see Emma Kent. She's our sales and finance manager listening in, so I just want to give a shout out to her as she's led those efforts. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> um, and I should have, should have moved forward with that in terms of the slides, but I think um, you know, you bring up a great point also when you're in transition and or um, you have a situation where, for example, you have a percentage of very large deals, but the majority of your sales are more consistent, you know, smaller deals, and how do you manage that? And at the same time, um, you know, one of the issues in managing a sales organization, and especially in SaaS, is how do you focus the sales organization on the right kind of customers? And most companies would typically define the right kind of customers as ones where your product is sticky, so they're going to renew. Um, whereas, you know, when you have a sales organization, as most um, growth companies do, that are very aggressive and they just want to bring on any business as possible. If you, you know, most companies have products that aren't necessarily the right product for every customer. Um, and that's some of the sort of nuances that companies have a hard time defining in their comp plan because you can end up having a lot of customers that don't renew, a lot of customers um, that maybe are unprofitable. Sometimes those big deals are more unprofitable than the average deals. Have you, and I'll say this to Michael because I think Anthony, your business is is a very high growth and you know pretty stable, and you have such a horizontal product. Um, and Michael, I think your company has seen that there's some different types of customers that you're going after out there. Have you seen that in terms of trying to manage the sales organization in the right direction? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think you know over time, as you know, like I mentioned, we're a four-year-old company. I think we've learned. Uh, especially being an insurance broker that with a kind of a wide footprint working with over 400 carriers, uh, that there are certain carriers that we work pretty well with uh, and we can integrate with and we can automate some of our feeds back and forth uh, to really provide a great uh, broker services, a broker service. Uh, but there's also some carriers and some states that we don't work well with. So, you know, incentivizing salespeople to not play in those states or exiting those states altogether has definitely been some things that we've, that we've kind of transitioned to uh, to over over time. Yeah, and that's great. And you know, it it's an example of um, a maturing of a company to understand that because you know some sales organizations take a while to figure that out. Um, so the next area that I want to talk about, um, as much as you both feel comfortable talking about, are you know, talking about commissions and commission structures. Um, so an easy question typically is, are you paying um, different rates, commission rates on product versus professional services? Because usually the gross margin on professional services is much lower than on uh, the recurring product. Um, Anthony, um, does that apply to your business? Not really. We made a strategic choice early on that we would not um, go after professional services. Our our business model model being ease of implementation and you know so easy that anybody could really do it. It doesn't need to have a security background to even do that. 
So we've never emphasized professional services, and we don't really deliver them. We don't even have an SKU for it, to be honest. It's all based on the SAS subscription. Okay. So that's nice and clean and easy. Um, how about you, Anthony? I can't remember. Do you all sell professional services as well? Uh, yeah, so uh, we uh, initially did not charge for our professional services. We took on the implementation costs and considered that a, a cost of our acquisition. Uh, mm -hmm. Going forward, we are going to have different tiers of implementation professional services. Um, but that has, not some, that has not actually been something that we've charged for in the past, uh, but our customers will be seeing that from us soon. Okay. And then um, I, I'm interested in your past life. Um, have you seen different commission rates for products versus professional services? And that was for Michael. Oh, for me? Um, I've, I've, I've typically seen it be uh, kind of bundled in into the same into the same into the same rate. Um, okay. But yeah. I, yep. So basically, paying on the total contract value, regardless of what it's made up of. That's right. Okay. Cool. And then um, Anthony, um, you mentioned that your sales people do not sell renewals. So, do they sell both? You know, obviously they get paid on new customers. Do they also get paid on expansion to new customers? And if so, is there a limit to how long they can hold a customer to sell into them? No. Um, there, to, to answer the second question, no, there's no limit on that. Uh, we, we only comp our salespeople on exactly that, new, new customers, so customers who have never used Duo before, and this is the first time they've signed up with us and any expansion that an existing customer that was originally theirs or maybe they inherited it from another, uh, another uh, account rep. Uh, but we definitely focus on expansion. So when we, when we set an ACV target for the year for the company, that ACV target is new customers plus expansion of existing customers. So we're looking at all new additional marginal business. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you don't differentiate between new business and expansion business? No, not as far as the ACV plans are concerned. They have an ACV target. We as a company have an overall target of how much we expect expansion to contribute, but um, it's, not a, it's not an incentivized number. So however we get the ACV, uh, that is fine, um, and we have expectations about how much of that's going to be brand new versus um, expansion. Yep, okay. And for you, Michael, in terms of um, – is there a different rate between new business, expansion business, and renewals? Uh, yeah, there's a different rate. So previously, on the, the existing business model, the uh, renewal happened with the insurance broker, a registered insurance broker, who took the client through open enrollment, and that was kind of the, the renewal to keep the revenue stream. Uh, now we're going to be spinning up uh, kind of a renewals and expansion team under our new model. Okay. Cool. And then um, I guess I know a lot of companies don't want to talk about um, specific OTE or specific commission rates, but um, Anthony, would you be comfortable sharing with us um, you know, what percentage of OTE is variable for your uh, reps? Yeah, no problem. We're generally 50-50. 50 base and 50 variable. Okay. And Michael, what would you say? Uh, we, we target uh, 40 base, 60 variable. Okay. Great. And then um, at, uh, at quota, um, presumably you have accelerators, and then do your accelerators increase or decrease, I mean, I've seen actually both models over quota. And then I'll throw that out to Anthony. Our accelerators increase. So as they get further and further up the chain or further and further exceeding their, their um, expectations, the rewards actually get higher. Okay. And Michael, same thing? Yes. Okay. And just in either of your experience, have you seen places where the accelerator goes off the rail. I mean, typically, in general, 
sort of a rule of thumb is that you expect that your highest performing salespeople are the most profitable for the company. Um, but the, even in spite of the fact that they may be selling you know, $10 million, um, I mean, I'm sorry, they might get paid a million or $2 million if they have that kind of acceleration, but they're selling so much that their cost to the revenue is, is highly profitable. But have you seen nuances or places where that actually didn't work and the high performing salespeople actually were pretty expensive for the company? Anthony, I'll start with you. No, I haven't really. Um, I've seen, certainly I've seen commission plans that have gone um, sideways. I was thinking of one more recently that uh, had happened, but not on the acceleration phase was on how it was structured. But uh, accelerators are, are something that, you know, depends on what industry you're in. Uh, for example, I've never, I never really saw an accelerator in the manufacturing base. Um, it was all driven on gross margin, and it was generally a cap that you couldn't go over a certain commission amount, which I always you know, felt philosophically was kind of rewarding the wrong behavior. I mean, you want your salespeople to go out and sell, 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 and not go out and say, okay, I've sold to my limit, I can go take a vacation now. Um, that's not the best interest of a company's growth. So I'm a big fan of accelerators and, have all, and always have been, um, and have not really seen them go too far off the rails because once they're structured in a true accelerating manner, you get some pretty high performers. Yeah, they get paid a lot. But let's, let's all face it, the highest comp people in the world tend to be the salespeople, um, and that's for good reason. Yeah. Well, and, and like I said, generally, um, you know, successful companies, the, the analysis shows that the highest performers are very profitable for the company. Um, I so think it helps in our case because we're software and we don't really have, I mean, if you, if you take a look at your typical gross margins for software, especially software as a subscription, the ongoing operating cost uh, to actually deliver the software once it's developed, and even if you roll in the amortization of the development, you know, typically it's not a, you know, a very large amount in terms of the cost of revenue. So you end up with really fat gross margins. And when you're dealing with a company such as Duo, where we have a fairly homogeneous uh, product mix, uh, we're, not, you know, we're not selling different gross margins, if you will, which in a product-based business, you could have wildly different you know, gross margins, and maybe that would be the better way to comp. In our case, because we have you know, basically one gross margin, if they sell a lot or a little, it's all the same gross margin, it's all the same free cash flow to the operating expenses as you know, any other particular product. So it makes it easier for us to structure accelerators that way. Because again, administratively, we don't have to worry about differentiation on gross margin based on what product they actually sold. Yeah. No, that's interesting. And Michael, do you, is that true for your company? Uh, I, um, with, with respect to accelerators kind of going a little bit sideways, I mean, I've, I haven't seen it. Um, I've seen, you know, sizing of quotas be a little bit low, and that's essentially the same thing uh, as we kind of transition and learn about the business. But early stage, I, before I was at Benefits, I know that there was some, um, you know, people making a lot of money in kind of the early stages. I've also advised a few other startups in the area that year one, year two, as you're figuring out how you want to pay folks, figuring out what your deal size should be, uh, not really having a, a good understanding of kind of your funnel and your pipeline uh, that, you know, people at kind of these early stage companies that are still learning uh, end up having a couple months where they might over overpay some folks. Yeah. Cool. I'm just looking at, we've got a whole bunch of um, questions that have come in. Um, and one of the things maybe I'll, uh, go back and, and clarify. I think, Anthony, you said that your salespeople don't um, do renewals. Um, it doesn't mean that you don't have people working on that and that they're not um, compensated and incented to, to renew um, customers, right? Yes and no. Uh, we have an entire customer success team uh, that, uh, that does nothing but manage the renewals process. That's their entire focus. So they're in there and trying, you know, making sure that at least the, the base contract, what we call the protected ACV, is continued going forward. Um, and their their departmental objectives are based on uh, the what we call the churn and contraction rate. So if we churn, we lose a customer. Contract if they go down in in some sort of subscription manner, but they still remain a customer. 
but because that is departmental specific to them again i go back to everybody outside of the sales organization is you know their their incentive pay the variable component of everybody outside of sales is is targeted towards the annualized run rate the arr so and part of that is keeping customers a big part of that is keeping your you know protecting your customer base so by focusing the non-sales part of the organization on the renewals and on the base arr and keeping that intact and letting sales go out and expand towards the new horizons and the new businesses, we think we've got a pretty effective model. Yeah. No, and I, I think it also depends on the, the, you know, the product and your, your mm -hmm. churn rates and the stickiness of the product. Um, one, one question that came in is whether you claw back for churn and I guess I would throw out there that I haven't heard of companies doing that, or at least I haven't frequently heard of it. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff out there in comp plans. Um, when you have an annual contract, it might be something that you would try and manage for when you're selling monthly. Um, but Anthony, have you seen clawbacks for churn? No, we don't do that. And have you seen that? Yeah, uh, yeah. This is Michael. Yeah, we we were doing a 90-day clawback uh, when we were doing uh, on, on the existing business model when we didn't have contracts. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it really depends on whether I think it depends on the product and the contract that you're selling because if um, you know if. Uh, customers can't if they paid up front. The salesperson's done their done their job, um, and yeah. then it depends on your product and the customer satisfaction. Yeah, I think Duo has yes. a couple of unique aspects to its business model that allows us to decouple that um, churn and contraction from any clawback. The only time we've ever done a clawback is if we've invoiced a customer, and 90 to 120 days later, they still haven't paid their invoice and we get a BK notice or we get some sort of termination of the contract. And, you know, we're not going to fight our customers on that. You know, if they really don't want the product, we're not going to force it on them and go into a collections mode. At that point, and it's kind of on a case-by-case -case basis because it's so rare, uh, we may do a clawback to the initial salesperson, you know, for that contract. And, and they would be involved in trying to retain the customers. So we would get, make sure that they were, you know, involved to try and keep that in place. But, again, it's a fairly, fairly corner case, very, uh, a fairly limited corner case. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And then there's another question about looking at, do you look at accelerators by month or year to date? And, um, do you have any comments on that, Anthony? Ours are all annual. We had quarterly at some point, but again, we realized that, you know, back to uh, Michael's point, setting your quotas is a really, you know, very important aspect. You know, that's, if your accelerators are going to go wrong, that, that probably should have been the obvious case to, to stay up front is you set your, your quotas too low and your accelerators kick in at, at a much earlier when they should have. So we set all of our annual, all of ours now to an annual um, accelerator. So the big payoffs are at the end of the year. Yep. Anthony, and, any comments on that? Yeah, this is Michael. We were we Sorry, previously did accelerators on a monthly basis, and now we're moving towards quarterly. Okay. Well, let's um, talk a little bit about. Um, sorry. Um, Outside of um, accelerators and commissions, um, some of the other rewards that companies typically use with their sales organization. I mean, most companies use President uh, Club, um, but there's been a lot more research and, and talk about a lot of other incentives, like team-based incentives. Um, I've seen lots of companies where the sales performance even on a personal basis, you know, is listed on television screens throughout the whole company. So you can see each salesperson and, you know, what their achievement to date against quota is. Um, that's kind of a, a reward or, or incentive or performance um, system to, you know, try and encourage people to, to compete against each other. Um, stock awards, which can also have some upside and downside. Um, 
Do you want to talk, Anthony, about you know the kind of um, kind of incentives that you use outside of just straight commission? We really just use two. Um, we have a, a semi-annual top achievers uh, event where the top achievers for the, the different segments and different verticals that we have identified in different teams within the sales organization uh, get to go have a great time somewhere, uh, collectively. So that's the reward is a, a cool trip to doing something cool. Um, I think one, one time they took them out to a race car track and everybody got to drive, you know, 200 mile an hour stock car races and kind of things like that. So it's, that's, it's kind of not just cool, not just a trip, but something that has kind of a cool component to it. So it makes it a little bit eye popping. And the other is SPIFs. Uh, we don't really use the team-based rewards. Uh, stock is not part of the mix either, and pretty much that's pretty much how we do it. Okay. And Anthony, I'm sorry, Michael. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no problem. A hard time going back and forth. Michael, how about you? What kind of incentives do you use? Uh, so we've previously done President's Club, and I think we're going to be returning to that. Uh, we haven't done team-based awards. We do give um, people stock, but only at the at the start of the, when they kind of start their career benefits. Uh, we we do do spiffs, uh, and we do them kind of. In, we've previously done them informally, uh, as and now part of our kind of new compensation philosophy and plan, it's going to be uh, formal and documented. Great. Well, it's and it, what kind of things do you do in terms of SPIFs? Is it very, you know, specific things like, you know, focus on, you know, don't discount or sell a whole bunch of customers by a certain date or can you describe some of the different things that you've used SPIFs for? Uh, yep. Um, so, I mean, I guess one thing I should have kind of led with when I was talking to our business model is we've gone through three restructurings uh, in the past year and a half. Uh, our sales force has included all of those restructurings. Um, so with each of those, you know, we were primarily a marketing first organization. Uh, we shifted away from outbound. Um, and you know, when you are analyzing your funnel and you can't keep your, can't really feed your your sales folks. Um, you know, in some cases we've been incentivized just to keep people happy, uh, keep them around, keep morale up. Uh, we've yeah. also incentivized. We've also incentivized salespeople to go out and do outbound, do their own prospecting, uh, when previously you know, they were used to getting fed by an outbound, outbound team or fed from a, uh, from a marketing team. Um, so things, things come along those lines. Okay. Interesting. Um, cool. Well, let's, um, let's talk about comp plans for sales management because – and. If you have different layers of management, it would be interesting to hear, are they compensated in the same way as the sales reps? Are they, do you add bonuses associated with corporate goals like gross margin or anything like that? Um, or you know, churn, renewal rates? Um, Anthony, how are you doing that at Duo Security? It's, you know, it's kind of a, a typical build-up scheme, which is it's all ACV. So, you know the worldwide the president vice president of worldwide sales is you know his he's comped on you know the achievement of the global ACV. Uh, our EMEA vice president he's comped on the you know the total amount that's in EMEA and different segments on down our enterprise versus the other go-to markets that we do. So again, it's all fairly unified and uniform in terms of the approach and in being ACV focused. Uh huh. And it and your VP of sales, your head of sales, isn't. Um, bonused on anything other than just straight ACV? It is new business. Okay. Interesting. So it doesn't sound like you're too concerned about gross margin or any other issues other than just total growth. As you had mentioned earlier in the call, we have a horizontal product. So because we can apply to literally any organization, it doesn't matter what size they are, it doesn't really matter what vertical or industry they happen to be associated with SIC or NAICS code. So we don't do any real differentiation on that. Because of that and the fact that our product is fairly uniform and is totally uniform as far as the gross margin is concerned, again, we're kind of a, in an easy case situation for us to develop a plan that actually totally aligns with what the company's overall strategic objectives are, which is growth. Uh-huh. Interesting. And then, um, actually, if I could follow up, because we had this conversation when we were 
prepping. And um, it's interesting to me, we, I asked you about discounting and managing discounting and whether you use the comp plans and or sales management um, plans to manage discounting. And you had an interesting, you know, you don't. Um, and you keep that separate. But if you could explain how you manage that, that would be great. So we, we have decoupled those. And by keeping the, the sales team focused on the new business uh, and the expansion business and, and incentivizing them in that direction, you know, it, it, it's up to them to achieve their quota. So if their quota is, you know, half a million dollars or whatever it happens to be, you know, that, that's what their target is. If they go out there and they're trying to sell the product at a deep, deep discount in order to achieve that, obviously that would eat into our gross margin. That would eat into our profitability. So we put a check in there that says, okay, you have a discount card. Here's your discount card that you're allowed to based on what segment you're selling to, the company size and whatnot. And if you want to go outside of that, you have to get approval. So, and then that first step of approval, depending on how large that discount is, is going to be their immediate manager. And then if obviously for larger discounts, it's going to go further up the chain, ultimately all the way to the CFO if it's a substantial, you know, substantial enough. So we leave it up to the management team to manage the discounts because obviously keeping price consistent and protecting price so that we don't, you know, uh, give in a, a particular industry a particular advantage over another if we don't want to. Or you may choose, choose strategically to offer a discount to a customer who's really large. You know, maybe we've got a, a customer who's walking in with a, a six-figure user base, and you know, we really want to get them. And we may take that discount down really low. Well, it's a big deal anyway, so it's still going to achieve the ACV goal of the company. And you know, of course, larger customer expects a larger discount, so we're consistent with our overall philosophy. But the discount on that would probably be approved all the way up to the CFO. Yep. So again, it's protected by it's protected by management. The discounting is protected by management directly, um, but it's not their incentive. They're not really tied directly to it in that they have their ACV, and that's what they need to achieve. And you've met, you mentioned a couple times take the discount approval all the way up to the CFO. So is the CFO the final decision maker, or is it the CFO and the VP of Sales together? Collaboratively, it's it's very much a collaborative issue. I mean, the the CFO is you know when we look at finance and what its purpose is, we're enablers. We're here to enable the organization and to support it. We're not there to get in its way. We're not there to create impediments. But ultimately, we're also there to protect the assets and the value of the company. So we have to play the the, the two sides of the role. We want the customer to to come into the fold as well, but we don't want to do it in a manner that you know financially uh, hurts the company. So yep. I, I've not really ever seen, you know, and usually what it ends up is it's part of the negotiation. So the CFO, CFO will be involved in the negotiations in terms of what discounts are being you know, offered and discussed. A, a deal that large that would involve the CFO's approval would be one that would be you know, a fairly uh, customized contract for that particular customer. And you know, I think you describe a situation that is ultimately um, part of the reason why you're so successful is that you you do seem like you have a, you know the management team is aligned around the company goals and it's around growth and you don't have people trying to game the system or, or taking advantage of it at least at the senior level and and it sounds like you you have good good mature managers who can work together which um, sounds like it should be obvious but you know, not all companies have that, and so then you try and you try and mitigate problems through contracts or comp plans or whatever. And um, it is always where I've seen where I've seen commission plans go sideways in terms of using your term gaming the system is in its complexity. The more what I found in my experience, not speaking about Duo in particular, but speaking over the you know the, the length of time I've been in the field, where I've seen systems gamed most commonly is ones that were more complex. Mm -hmm. The more rules you have and the more conditions you have and the more et cetera, the more opportunity you have for somebody to figure a way around it or through it or above it. So by keeping things simple and, and very black and white to everybody, it really reduces the ability to game the system because then the game becomes, you know, basically plan-wide and we all look and say, oh, well, that didn't work, you know, so we need to change that. 
Um, <clears throat> and then we make a systemic change that applies to all people and then maintains fairness. The other thing too is you don't want you don't want people to feel like they're being favored um, or others are being favored over them, I should say. So by keeping it uniform and keeping it simple and keeping it easy to understand, that you know eliminates a lot of the problems that I've seen historically with comp plans when it comes to salespeople. Exactly. No, I think you're exactly right. Um, Michael, from, from your perspective, um, and I don't know if discounting comes into it. Um, I mean, obviously, every soft, as you transition into selling the software, um, it certainly will come up in some form. Um, although in the SMB space, you know, it tends to be less of an issue than in the enterprise space. Um, so it would be interesting, have you run into that, and how do you handle it uh, at Zenefit? Uh, can you repeat that? You said, can you repeat the question, please? Oh, sorry, I'm, I can't, can't quite hear you. Hello? Michael? Yeah, it was, it was cutting in and out. Are you there? Yeah. Sorry, oh, I'm I... sorry, can you repeat the question? Yep. Yeah, sure. Um, the question is about discounting and um, how you handle that. Some companies try and handle it through the sales comp plan or through a bonus of the VP of sales to manage discounting you know, sort of globally. Um, I, my experience is that discounting typically with SMB sales, you, know, you don't have as much margin. Your prices are smaller so you're not discounting quite as much as when you're doing big deals with enterprise uh, customers. But how do you handle it? Um, you know, Anthony described they keep, you know, they keep it completely separate from the comp plan side, and even the VP of sales is not tied to that kind of thing. And it's a collaborative, you know, they have a discount card and structure and, um, you know, handle any Thing that they need to on a one-off basis going all the way up to the, the CFO um, working collaboratively with sales. Um, how yep. do you yep. guys handle it at Zenefits? Yeah, our, we're, we're very similar. So I think right now I mentioned we're in the middle of kind of this transition of converting our existing customer base. So we do have some different discount dates. Uh, and we keep it rules-based. So everybody on the sales team is familiar with the rules that are uh, kind of within their control. Uh, and then anything outside of that, with an exception case, is, is escalated up to the VP of sales and to the VP of finance uh, for, for mutual improvement. Uh, in terms of compensation, uh, our VP of sales is also just tied to just tied to growth. Okay. Cool. Uh, but we, we do have a new CRO who's coming in who oversees both sales and service, and his compensation is going to be tied to um, both the, both growth and margin. Uh huh, and and that probably makes sense as you were starting off with a new business model until you have a run rate and understand, you know, how it works. Um, That's right. So I have a question here on what's the normal uplift percentage between corporate and field targets. Um, I'm sort of wondering if when I think of field, I think of the. Um, folks out in the field, and I'm assuming um, that means the difference between an individual rep's um, uh, quota or you know, target percentage of sales. Um, that's kind of hard to answer. It depends on the size of the company, I think, but I might be misunderstanding the question. I apologize about that. Do you have any comments on that, um, Anthony, in terms of differences between corporate and field targets. I mean, my perspective would be it really depends on the size of the company. Um, well, I think in our case we don't really have, and it may also be how your sales team is structured. Our sales team tends to, with the exception of the enterprise segment, tends to be office-based. Um, we, you know, inbound, outbound development through our ADR team, providing, you know, market qualified leads, turning those to sales qualified leads and turning them over to the sales force. So our sales, the, there's one specific part of our team that is responsible for handling the inbound and the outbound uh, leads, and then those are farmed out, obviously, to the various reps to follow up and, and close the deals. So there aren't really people in the field. 
Um, everybody's pretty much office based. We do have some of our enterprise reps who are, you know, remote, and of course they do a lot of travel because that's the way the enterprise market works. But their comp plans are based on obviously much larger ACV targets because of who they're going after, and their comp plans are structured accordingly to make sure that their OTE is consistent on that 50-50 basis along with everybody else in the organization. So there's really, I would say there isn't a differentiation, um, certainly none that's apparent or apparent to me built into the way the system has been designed. Yeah, um, let me take a different take on the question in a way. So. Some traditional sort of sales planning structures are, you know, let's say you have each, just to make it simple, each rep has a quota of a million dollars. And let's say you have 10 reps. So you have the capacity ideally to sell 10 million, um, but you're targeting an 80% quota achievement. And so the VP of sales, you might give them a target of 8 million. Um, you might give them a target of 9 million. You might give them a target of 10 million, um, depending on your sort of strategy. And then you might have an assumption of the company um, target being 7 million, something like that. Um, can you talk a little bit about just straight between the, you know, the total of the rep targets added up and the compare, you know, how you, what the comparison is between that and the, you know, head of sales. Something you feel yep. comfortable talking about? I, I can't really speak to that, unfortunately. Um, that would be getting probably a little bit too detailed. And also, I'm not, to be honest, that familiar with how we do that. Um, I'm familiar with the overall ACV targets for the, the reps, but uh, if you give me a few minutes, I'll take a look at my spreadsheet and see if, the, if there's any of that kind of discounting roll-up, it sounds like. Um, so if you know, the individual members of my team each are tasked with a million, um, and I have 10 members, is, is my quota 10 million or is my quota less than that? Um, I can probably answer that. I just need to take a look at a specific example. So if you give me a few minutes, I'll take a look at that and give you an answer. Yeah, that'd be great. And Michael, you, yeah, I that, know you... That is how we do, that is how we do it. So we do a, we do a traditional roll-up strategy. Uh, and I think generally uh, you, you target, you know, what you want your individual rep, what that percentage to hit is. Uh, we target in the 70 to 80 percent range, uh, yeah. and then we give uh, the management on that roll up an 80 percent of that, of that total. Okay. And is that true? I guess it depends on the size of your sales organization because you may have a head of sales and you may have directors and that kind of thing. Um, and sometimes you have different. So it, 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 yeah, it, it cascades up to every single every single level. We try to keep it to two tiers. Okay, cool, great. Well, I will. I would invite the audience to send your um, into about the last five minutes of our webinar. So please shoot any questions you have into you know put them into chat, and we'll try and cover them now. And anything that you want to ask. Afterwards, we'd be happy to, to look at or um, get back to you individually. Um, one of the things I did want to learn from your experience, um, both of you, in terms of how, you know, the kind of sales plans that you've worked with and, um, you know, some companies spend huge amounts of money on uh, consulting firms that design sales comp plans. Um, you both are with pretty hot companies. Um, you know, for practices and tips, I think, Anthony, you know, one of the basic things you mentioned is keeping it simple. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have other thoughts about that or tips that you'd like to share with the group? I think the other thing too is don't, don't try and customize um, your sales, con your, your compensation agreements with each individual uh, salesperson. You know, we, I've seen organizations where Joe has one contract and Jane has another contract and Jill has a third contract and they're not all the same. And, and they essentially do the same thing. So simplification both in terms of what the overall goals are and also just in terms of how the contracts are put together. Um, I think that really is the rule of the day. And I think you'd say simplification of um, the goals but also, you know, one of the big points is simplification of, of how you, you know, figure out the payout, I assume, is part of that as well. Because I've seen comp plans that are so complicated that 
the salespeople and even the finance people sometimes have a hard time figuring out, so how much do we owe here? Yeah, so we have a we we we've gone through that phase. Uh, definitely, when I first came on board a couple of th couple three years ago, it was like, so how did you structure the spreadsheet? Um, and we've you know spent a lot of time and effort in making sure that that gets standardized. But it it's got to be something where it's really a collaborative effort between uh, where where I've seen things go wrong. I guess if there's another best best practice is that it needs to be a collaborative effort between the sales ops people who are going to be producing the data the finance people who are going to be using that data to validate that data and calculate it, and the sales team itself in terms of what they're trying to incentivize. If you try to put this together in a silo method with one of these groups leading it or one of these groups taking it and then bringing it back, you just end up with a lot of back and forth and a lot of circular conversation. So having the three teams and players involved in how these things are structured and how they're administered and how they're calculated really reduces a lot of the confusion um, and, and on the end result. Yeah. Any really specific examples of how you had to simplify the, the plan? Um, well, we were doing it you know, in the beginning. It was, it's probably typical of a lot of companies that are coming from the mom and pop stage into the company stage, moving on to the corporate stage. There's a lot of manual transactions, a lot of stuff being keyed in by hand. So really leveraging our IS team and leveraging uh, you know, automation and using more advanced macros and analytical tools and planning tools and budgeting tools, a lot of that has really helped. So it's, it's one of those things where it depends on how much money you and resources you have to devote to these things and you know, taking the steps to actually put that into you know, objectives and making those achievable objectives um, and rewarding the managers for getting those into place. And I guess that leads into the next one, and I'll, I'll stick with you, Anthony, and then I want to switch over to Michael before we get to the top of the hour. Um, are there any specific software tools that you would recommend, or is it just macros that you've developed? We are evaluating, but because of our um, focus on growth, we're less focused on some of the infrastructure stuff, so we actually haven't used the sales commission tool yet. We've evaluated one or two, um, and I don't honestly even remember the names because it was a year, year and a half ago. But so far we've been able to do pretty well with just using our uh, data extraction tools. And uh, we've got a, a data warehouse now that we're working on and a mining tool to go along with it. So that's probably the direction we're going to end up going is a, a data warehousing and mining tool that is incorporating all corporate data in its entirety. Okay, cool. And Michael, do you want to talk about your – Best practices or tips and then use? Yep. So we have uh, sales ops lives within sales. I think that's one dis one thing to kind of distinguish as far as setting the compensation plan for this coming year. Uh, we did bring in an outside consultancy to kind of help with best practices uh, with executive sponsorship from kind of our team uh, or the various, you know, kind of key players to roll out this new plan. Um, in terms of technology, we've previously used Calidus. Uh, we use Anaplan on the FP&A side. We thought about using Anaplan for the sales commission side. Um, but as we re we've, we've reduced um, kind of our sales team, uh, we've, we've just optimized for, sim for simplifying. Uh, so we've kind of uh, got out of the complex technology that you would, you would be using with, you know, a sales force over 500 uh, to now being down uh, around 50. Okay. And what I got – from the conversation was that in terms of best practices and tips, it would be, you know, make sure you have you simplify the goals, simplify the calculation of the payout, and treat everyone the same. Would you have anything to add to that on top of that, or does that cover how you would focus on it? Pretty much Sorry. covers it. Yeah, I, th I think that I think that covers it. Okay, great. I apologize. We're right up against the top of the hour. We have a couple more questions that have come in, um, but we hate to keep people hanging on. I'll ask one of them just quickly um, if our speakers don't mind. Um, I'll throw that out there. One of the questions is whether you do include, and I don't think either of you did, um, gross margin as part of um, what you track or incentivize. I 
think we're losing people maybe. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap things up. Thank you so much to both of our speakers. I really appreciate both Anthony and Michael sharing your, your um, experience and, and information about your own companies and, and your uh, thoughts about this. And again, for anybody who has additional questions, feel free to reach out to me, Lauren, at opexengine.com, and we'll, we'll definitely get back to you. And we'll be sending out a recording of this to everybody who's registered online. So again, thank you everybody, and thanks to the audience for hanging in there right through to the end. Thanks very much. Bye.